Hey there, and welcome back to Reading Rule, y'all. I'm your host, Dr. Shay Parton, and this week I am so excited to be talking to author and fellow Midwesterner, Christopher Barzak. He's the author of the Crawford Fantasy Award-winning novel, One for Sorrow, which has been made into the Sundance feature film, Jamie Marks is Dead. His second novel, The Love We Share Without Knowing, was a finalist for the Nebula Award and the James Tiptree Jr. Award. His third novel, Wonders of the Invisible World, was published by Knopf, in 2015 and received the Stonewall Honor Award from the American Library Association. He is also the author of two collections, Birds and Birthdays, a collection of surrealist fantasy stories, and Before and After Lives, a collection of supernatural fantasies, which won Best Collection in the 2013 Shirley Jackson Awards. His most recent novel, The Gone Away Place, which is hopefully one that we will dig into today, was released by Knopf in 2018 and was a recipient of the 2019 Whipple Roll Book Award for Excellence in Rural Young Adult Literature. He grew up in rural Ohio, has lived in a Southern California beach town, the capital of Michigan, and has taught English outside of Tokyo, Japan, where he lived for two years. Currently, he teaches fiction writing in the Northeast Ohio MFA program at Youngstown State University. And so welcome, Chris. I'm so excited to be talking with you today and thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So the first question that I always ask because it's my main obsession is um, tell me a little bit about your background and where you're from and how you feel like that's impacted who you are as a person and as a writer. Uh, I grew up uh, in a very small town in Northeastern Ohio. It's called Johnston. Uh, when I was a teenager, the population there was around 3,000 people. Currently, it's around 2,000. Uh, so it has continued to d diminish over the years. Uh, it's a, 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 a sort of quintessential small town in Ohio where you have like one uh, light, you know, blinking in, in, in the center intersection of town. And uh, uh, most of the people who work there uh, are either working in agriculture or in some kind of industrial kind of work. Uh, and uh, I grew up uh, on my grandfather's farm. It was uh, a beef cattle farm, and uh, he also grew all of the grains that he needed to to create the the, the mix to feed his own cattle. Um, and uh, I have two older brothers and uh, the three of us, as well as our cousins who lived down the road, uh, uh, all helped him work that farm as we uh, grew up. And uh, uh, as for uh, how that has affected me or influenced me and, you know, as a person, I think no matter where I, I go, uh, uh, and, I, and I've traveled in a number of places, which you listed in my introduction, and, and I've lived in Japan, uh, that wherever I go, I, I, I kind of feel like a, a small town person, no matter how urban the space is that I've settled down in. Uh, and I feel kind of hopelessly Midwestern. <laughs> and, uh, always the, the, the green person who's just off of the bus in, you know, in Hollywood trying to figure out uh, this this new place and and how to get uh get involved really I think that one of the things that one of the influences of growing up in that way uh, is that I'm a very civic minded person so wherever I do go I end up putting um, my my roots down into that place and trying to get to know people uh, in the way in a way that I think is very small town because uh, when you grow up with only a few thousand people in your community you know everyone and so your instinct wherever I've gone to live is to try to, to get to know as many people as possible uh, and uh, as an author I think that uh, you know that growing up that way what how that's influenced me as a writer is that I tend to write about small groups of people small communities uh, even in my second novel The Love We Share Without Knowing it's set in Japan uh, and there are uh, sections of that book set in Tokyo, but largely even there, it's it's set in rural uh, Japan, uh, which is where I was uh, stationed to teach. And uh, I, I even, even so even when I'm writing about a, a place that's as far flung from from rural Ohio as as Japan, uh, I end up writing about rural places. It, it seems more often than not. 
And I, I've thought about this a lot and I've written about it too. It's funny. Most of the rural people that I interact with look for the rural wherever they go. And they yeah. look for something that feels like home. So like, so I moved to where I live because they grow corn around here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, yeah. I think that there's just something about, there's just something about place that like, wherever you go, even if it's outside of your home, you're looking for things that make you feel at home in that new place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I think about um, when I was in Japan, and that was like the the most unfamiliar place that I had lived. Uh, w- one of the things that I did, I, I did look for things that were familiar, even if I was in a place that was really really different for me. And and I can still remember some of the things that I identified with very early on uh, was were the. Uh, the, the random animals that that would roam you know, that these these sort of like back roads and streets in in Ami Japan where I lived and uh, uh, you know I would I would go running you know on 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 the back roads and you know was surrounded by soybean fields there too <laughs> and, and uh, there was a, a sense there too of. Uh, uh, the the kind of change of seasons that, that I think that uh, a, a rural person is attuned to. I think everybody is obviously attuned to season seasonal change, but I think in in a rural, if you've grown up in a rural place, that that also it coordinates your life in a different way. Um, it's not simply that now we change our clothes <laughs> and, and maybe change some of the things we eat, but it changes the work that we do, uh, you know, and the kind of, you know, in the winter, you know, battling the elements, so to speak, mm-hmm. you know, even just taking care of livestock, mm-hmm. um, that kind of a thing. So uh, it, it was uh, something that I also uh, became attuned to in Japan too, was the change of the seasons, which I, which is something that they appreciate there and, and kind of honor uh, in a huge way with a, a lot of seasonal kinds of rituals and traditions and uh, which which I appreciated while I was there so yeah it was a, it was a way for me to, to find home even in, in a in a very different place that's funny you know here in in Temple Texas <laughs> the 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 seasons don't I mean they do change but it's like for a split second it's an equinox you know it's just like for a split second right. but then I'll call home and mom will be like you know yeah we're getting the planner ready or we're ready to go out and disc or you know like what whatever <laughs> it is it's like this is yeah. this is what we're doing now because this is the time of year that it is um and I don't I don't have that here you know yeah, I remember feeling that for the first time when I, I moved to California for a year uh right out of college for my undergraduate degree and I can remember um telling like writing back to my mother and in in email and, and telling her that it was odd because it didn't feel like the se- there were seasons there it was just always just sort of like warm sunny days <laughs> and it didn't change very much even in winter uh, and and it felt odd. I felt sort of out of out of sync with time when that was gone. Yeah, yeah. And it I think for a lot of people, it feels like such a small thing. But it's like when you order your days and you kind of arrange your life by what's happening with the weather. Like I and I I read I wrote about this fairly recently. Like my three year old is obsessed with checking the weather because I am still <laughs> obsessed with checking weather you know and like yeah, whether yeah. it says that it's supposed to rain or not I still check the radar you know like yeah no I'm a bit weather obsessed too and I, and I think it was also my, my father was even more he was very obsessed with it but he worked for uh, our county engineer's office uh and uh so growing up he was you know one of the guys that would get called out uh, because of bad weather to like you know cut down a tree that had fallen across the street or uh during the winter to you know plow things like mm-hmm. that so he was constantly looking after the weather because his job depended on it yeah. yeah and my stepdad was very much the same way you know yeah. like when the weather came on the news right you better be quiet <laughs> you know yeah. like, you know, that was the time that you made sure that you were quiet because if if you couldn't hear the weather <laughs> it was yes. bad news bears absolutely um but yeah and and these are all things and I'm sure that people who live in non-rural places also pay attention to climate and also pay attention to, 
you know, what's happening, but not in the same way and not for the same reasons. And so not for the same reasons maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I think that difference is, um, I think it's important. I think it's important to acknowledge. And I think it's important, um, to see in, yeah. in books, which is one of the main reasons why we're here and, and talking with one another. Um, so you talked a little bit about, um, sort of your experience of agrarian rule. And one of the things that um, I'm being challenged to do through this work um, is to think about rural in a, in a more expansive and nuanced way, especially after um, the Rural Voices Anthology came out and I read that and I started to think about like, you know, there are so many different, there's so many different kinds of rural. Like we share a very similar rural because we're both from the Midwest. Right. Um, but I'm just curious, like what rural means um, to you, uh, for you, um, for your work? Um, how, like, how do you define rural and, and what does that mean about how you sort of go about your life and your writing? Yeah, uh, I think that for me, and, and as you mentioned, I do think rural is going to be different depending on where the, the rural uh, place is, uh, and and they're going to be different, you know, from from place to place, from region to region, from uh, kind of like geographical, you know, like dealing with different kinds of environments. You know, uh, there are rural desert communities that will be very different from you know a rural Midwestern farm town, you know, like where I grew up, uh, and uh, so things are going to change from from space to space but for me it was it was largely uh i i think a a space that uh had, it it felt like there was always a quality of remoteness to it that uh you know even to get to a mcdonald's you're going to have to drive almost a half hour maybe <laughs> and, uh so that, that the rest of the world felt far away from you and that you couldn't get to it very easily um uh, until you were able to drive and then even after that uh you know it, serving as a a, a ticket uh, for, to freedom so, so to speak uh, it was also still everything was still far away you know uh and uh uh, so, so yeah, remoteness was definitely a quality of uh, of, of of rural rural life and rural living to me, and uh, definitely a, a kind of attunement with the land, the, with nature, and with animals. Um, specifically, from you know, in in my experience, uh, uh, that was growing up on a farm, and uh, and dealing with with large livestock and showing them in 4-H and uh you know getting close to them and working with them i ended up quitting 4-h i didn't uh, you know after a certain point once i realized what the whole thing was about <laughs> i was i was not really on board with it but uh i did it for several years and um and the, the thing i enjoyed was was raising uh an animal but i i really wanted to keep the cows more of pets <laughs> instead of sell them uh and uh so uh, I ended up uh, leaving 4-H after that, once I realized that this was going to be the pattern, <laughs> no matter what, that you had to give your animal up after a year. Um, uh, but yeah, so it, for me, it was like being attuned to, to nature and to animals specifically. Uh, and to a, a kind of you know, sy symbiotic relationship uh, with that environment uh, that, that that feels a little bit different since you know I've I've gone and lived in in various kinds of urban spaces too and suburban spaces over the course of my life. Um, there's obviously a, a kind of sim, sim, symbiotic relationship that that at, we have with any kind of environment that that we live in. Uh, but I felt that you know the the way that I grew up it was it was it was starkly apparent. Uh, as opposed to uh, the, the kind of built up communities uh, that I've lived in in suburban and urban spaces where you can get a sense that, uh, you know, e nature is not a big deal. <laughs> you know, animals are, you know, creatures that, that live in the shadows <laughs> and, you know, on the tops of buildings, but, you know, not as, not as much uh, uh, sharing as much space with, with, with humans as, uh, as they did where, where I lived. So, 
so for me, it was really just, uh, I think, defined by, by those kinds of qualities, remoteness and, and a kind of uh, affinity with uh, animal life and, and with nature. It's funny, I, I'm a 10 year 4-H member, um, but we raised hogs when I was younger mm -hmm. until my stepdad felt like they were no longer as lucrative as they had once been. Yeah. Um, and I remember being like an eight year old <laughs> holding the plywood board, <laughs> yeah. you know, like <laughs> rounding the sows up for marking and stuff. Um, yep. And uh, and my siblings never had to do it because they were never big enough and strong enough. And my, my mom apparently was not afraid that a sow would knock me down and <laughs> she was afraid <laughs> for, the, for the other kids. Um, but so because of that experience, um, I wasn't allowed to show animals in 4-H. Um, we showed our border collies, um, right, right, right. but we didn't show animals. And so for me, it was like making my own clothes and, you know, doing foods and quilting and basket weaving. And, you know, um, I had friends who were in the cat club too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was always jealous of them. I, I paid for my first year of college with the savings from the, the, the several cows that I had sold the steer yeah. sold it at auction at the, the, the county fair. Yeah. I think about my kids and I think about the sort of different relationship that they have with the earth and with animals and with the environment, because they aren't growing up the same way that I grew up. Not that they would have to, right. um, but there's this aspect of like shared understanding that I want us to have. And so I also got them for them so that they can see what it's like, what it takes to like care for an animal and to raise an animal and to um exist in this relationship where you know you feed the animal and the animal feeds you yeah <laughs> you know? it, exactly it's an exchange uh which you know obviously it's it's there's an exchange between household pets and 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 their owners too but it's a different one it's it's one of companionship you know kind of exchange uh, as opposed to one that's that's sort of like life sustaining right you know? and even that like when i when i go home um, my dogs have, we like, we have a, a travel trailer specifically <laughs> for going to visit my parents and we park it on the farm because my dogs can't go inside because oh, right. dogs don't belong inside. They, I'm so glad inside. you said that because, <laughs> because that was my experience too. We, we weren't allowed to have animals in our house growing up, except for temporarily, like, if, you know, uh, our cat was, you know, allowed to come in, but she had to go out. She was not allowed to stay in. And uh, when I went to college and, and then moved out into the wider world, that was something that was, I think, odd to a lot of people who had, you know, had house pets, you know, and, but on the farm, it, that was not what, what the, the function of animal, to having these, these animals were. We had dogs and we had cats, but they, they lived outdoors and, you know, we took care of them, but uh, they were they were meant to to earn their keep to right. <laughs> the cats yeah. with yeah. their mouths. They had a job. Yeah. Yeah. And uh and the you know the cats definitely were they had to keep the any kind of mice infestation out of the granary. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um the you know the dogs were hunting dogs. So yeah. yeah exactly. Um, so that's, I mean, we have a very similar, <laughs> we have a yeah, very similar I know. I was like, <laughs> you're like the first person that I think that I've talked to in a long time that, that completely understood the no animals in the house rule. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, it is really fun and, um, like validating in some ways to like talk to somebody who like, no, who like really <laughs> understands. <laughs> exactly. And I think, you know, to sort of like pull us back to like the topic of this conversation. Um, and I think that's why like rural representation in books is so important, right? Because like, if you go so long without having a connection to that or, or to someone else who, who right. understands like, at least if you can pick up a book and there's a rural representation in it, like there is a connection there. And we talked a little bit about this before I, I started recording the interview, but like, even just reading in the gone away place, the, the sort of setting, you know, just descriptions of the setting and hay fields and soybean fields and, and that kind of stuff. Like, it seems like such a small thing, but it, it's such a big thing. Um, because it is. it's recognizable to me and I, I could exist in the world 
of the novel right. in a way that I can't usually in most of the stuff that gets published today. Yeah. And I think it's important for, for people to be able to see themselves in, in literature or film, you know, in art. Uh, and I, I grew up with an affinity to reading the, the Southern regionalist writers like Carson the Colors was a, was a huge favorite of mine, The Ballad of the Sad Cafe, especially, and The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. And then, you know, I, I enjoyed reading Flannery O'Connor and Truman Capote. And it was really like re reading about Southern uh, uh, landscapes that felt like home to me because they were often rural ones uh, that I realized as, as a young person that uh, I hadn't really seen where, where I come from uh, in, in fiction. And so even when I was just a, a very young writer in, uh, in, as an undergraduate in college, I, I can remember uh, determining that I would put the place where I'm from in, into literature. And uh, I thought it was important, uh, mainly because literature is also, it's an exchange. Uh, when we're talking about exchanges, you know, a little bit ago, uh, I think, you know, books are an exchange too, and that our writer is offering you uh, a place and, and, and a space to exist in. Uh, if there's someone that is oriented to particular places, then it might be that they're offering you where they're from, you know, to, to, to come there and visit. And as somebody who grew up rural, one of the main pleasures of reading for me was to be able to travel the world through books. Uh, and then at a certain point, I was able, you know, that I wanted other people to be able to see where I was from too, so that that was more of a a mutual exchange in in that in that way, and uh, I also just didn't I didn't want where I'm from to be forgotten. It's a very particularly uh, uh, embattled kind of kind of place in its history with a loss of of industry over the years, uh, which a lot of places have have suffered. Uh, but you know when Bruce Springsteen writes a song about where you're from, <laughs> it's never a good thing, usually. <laughs> uh, usually means that it's Struggle City. And uh, so I, I wanted to be able to, in, in, in some ways, legitimize the place through storytelling and to, uh, to show other people that uh, what that this place exists and that what its history is and that uh, it's in some ways a, 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 a part of the American story that isn't often told and isn't talked about um, largely because there was a lot of uh, failure of the American dream here uh, when the the steel industry left which was the the primary uh, industry outside of the agricultural areas in, in the region, uh, the, the city proper in Youngstown uh, uh, and Warren, Ohio, uh, in, in those two towns, it was steel. And when the steel industry left the United States and, and moved to other countries, uh, it left a huge hole in, in places like this. And the communities have deteriorated in, in a lot of ways. And, you know, we've struggled to maintain them over decades uh, and it's always uh, a battle. It's always a struggle. Uh, and, and it's not the typical story that, that people think of when they think of the America and uh, is the land of plenty and milk and honey, you know, kind of thing to, you know, there are a lot of places where people have been left behind. And uh, so I wanted to be able to inscribe that kind of story in into literature as well. The rural, our our rural areas in the United States, have, I think, largely, you know, one of the main themes uh, of life there has been exploitation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I don't think the people really know or understand that. I don't think so. Yeah, and I think things get kind of mixed up and, and lost in this discussion, especially this kind of contemporary discussion that we've had 
about uh, rural rural places in America because of things like the electoral college. Maybe you know, like in in that kind of discourse, people talk about how rural places have more weight in determining things like the presidency, and it gets it, they, so it gets uh, mixed up with this kind of sense that those places have power but they don't <laughs> in the end. Uh, and that's why you have, uh, you have people who uh, are from these places that are, that are talking about being left behind and not being integrated into uh, the, you know, a, any of the, the kind of benefits of, uh, of America and in, into the, the, you know, the land of milk and honey, as they, as they used to say uh, that, it, they've been exploited in in a, in a lot of ways, and nobody wants to talk about that. But they'll have a discussion about uh, electoral uh, counts being un, unequal. You know, in well, terms and of even our, if <laughs> even if we did have some like some power to put somebody in the presidency, I mean, is it going to be a farmer? You know? Right. Like, <laughs> it was the last one, Jimmy Carter. Right. 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 <laughs> it's my grandmother's favorite who... president for that reason. <laughs> which proves we are quintessentially cynical rural people. <laughs> but, it's, <laughs> but it's true, you know, the cynicism, I think, is, you know, comes from, seeing, uh, you know, being subjected to a pattern, you know, over yeah. and over uh, for many years. And, and experience. And are, you know, I'd like to be, you know, hopeful. <laughs> but, right. but, you know, experience says otherwise. And I think the only way that changes is if, is if we do what we're doing, right? If we yeah. tell rural stories, if we... Right. You know, if we nuance those, um, if we nuance those ideas, like, um, you know, the idea that rural America is a conservative, white, homophobic, racist right. monolith um, is incredibly problematic right. and not true. Right. Um, and so, like, you know, nuancing, and I think that's why a lot of people, too, like to sort of hate on rural America, too. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I think that there are just as many stereotypes of, of rural people as, as there are people in urban settings and that, in, you know, in any case, the stereotypes are limiting and they don't really acknowledge the, the broader uh, range of, of types of people uh, that, that you'll find in anywhere. And in all of the things that uh, I think that all of the negative things that uh, are associated with rural people, I have found in people from the largest cities as well. There's just as many examples of, of, of people uh, in, in uh, even places as diverse as, as New York City that, uh, you know, I have found uh, and, and experienced homophobia there. I've I was assaulted in in New York City in 2013 <laughs> in a in a uh, in a gay district, and uh, you know this isn't something that happens specifically in in rural areas. There's and 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 that that's one of the things that I think it's very easy to for people to to fall back on those stereotypes and to not acknowledge that the negative uh, aspects that sometimes rear their heads in rural uh, populations, those, those attitudes, uh, those, you know, and, and negative kinds of, of actions or behaviors, uh, they, they take place everywhere, really. Um, it might be that when it, it happens in rural America, uh, it, it be, there's something about it happening in that kind of, uh, the sense of a vacuum of, of the remote area that makes it feel like a big, um, a, a bigger explosive kind of narrative, um, maybe, and uh, and it reinforces the stereotypes. But I've, I've experienced that, uh, uh, you know, like I said, homophobia and uh, anti-gay behavior, pretty much anywhere I've I've been, regardless of whether it's rural or suburban or urban, and and I've seen racism everywhere as well. I think it's a more tellable narrative, right? Yeah, it's easy. If it happens, it's yeah, mm -hmm. if it happens in rural America, it's because it was in rural America. If it right. happens in the city, it's because the individual who did it had an issue, <laughs> right? Right, like, right, right. Um, and so because it's a more tellable narrative and it's more recognizable, 
then the stereotype persists. And I think that's like my biggest issue is that those stereotypes are considered socially acceptable. Yeah, like it's exactly. totally fine to insult a rural person or to make that assumption about a rural person or to, right. you know, parrot those stereotypes. That's completely acceptable. But if you, if you did that about a different population, yeah, it would be considered completely unacceptable. Right. Um, and so I think that's the thing that bothers me the most is that because it is so tellable and because people keep telling it that way and yeah. because there is not as much disruption as what maybe there needs to be, um, then it continues to be acceptable. No, oh, and, and I think we have to be more careful about the, the, the stories we tell because there's also like self-fulfilling prophecies, you know? Uh, to continue to tell stories about particular populations of people in a, in a particular way that is is in these negative ways, uh, it perpetuates the story in, in, a, in a way that people can inhabit that too. And I think that's hard, right? Because it's like, I talked about this a little bit with Pedro Hoffmeister, like you don't want to completely ignore that it does exist, but you sort of want to also challenge the fact that it doesn't exist because of where it is. It just exists because it exists everywhere. Right. So then, so like walking that line of like, like this person didn't have a racist reaction to this character in this story because they're in rural America. They had a racist interaction with this character. And maybe it was like, even like depictions of systemic racism, like that just exists everywhere. Like and right. it's not it's just systemic. <laughs> it's systemic for a reason, right? right. Yeah. It's 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 like woven into the fabric of American life and really just everywhere, you know, that, that racism is I know like when I have conversations with um with people who haven't spent much time outside of the United States, when they when they talk about racism, it's always American racism. And they in to a certain extent, they there's a kind of, you know. They, they, they have a kind of like blinders on about racism and how it functions outside of America too. I mean, one of the things that, that I encountered and that people uh, in, in Japan taught me about was a, a kind of racism just with throughout Asia, you know, and, and different Asian populations that, that had racist views of one another, you know, this is completely separate from American life and racism, you know, exists elsewhere as well in different constructs, you know, uh, different social constructions for it, uh, racism and classism too. Um, and, uh, you, you know, we sometimes get like, like caught in a kind of American silo, mm -hmm. I think, you know, where, where it also becomes this thing where this only happens here and, and that's not the case. No. Yeah. And so, th so thinking more about that, like, especially like geographically, um, I'm, I'm curious, especially because you spent so much time in Japan, um, especially and knowing that it sounds like it was in a pretty rural area. Um, one of the things that I I'm interested in kind of starting to think about is like the, the similarities and differences across sort of the American um, experience of rural as nuanced as that is, but, um, and what it looks like to be rural outside of the U S, um, especially in terms of like cultural practice and things like that. I feel like there's probably a lot of similarities just in terms of like relation to the environment and that yeah. kind of stuff. But so I, I'm just curious, like, um, what sort of noticings, what sort of like observations did you make about um, being rural in a global context that you feel like maybe impacts the way that you think about rurality or the way that you write about it? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it might be one that I'd have to have a little bit more time to think about. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, it just only, occurred to me. <laughs> no, only, only because, uh, you know, it's been, a, it's been a little while since, since I've been uh, in Japan and uh, like everywhere it's evolving, but, uh, I think that, uh, the things that you, that you mentioned, you know, right off the bat are, are true, you know, of, of, uh, of rural populations in Japan that, that there's obviously the, the, the kind of affinity and attunement, um, with, with the land, with the environment, 
Uh, Japan also is very attuned regardless, I think, with their environment, uh, largely because it's a, it's, it's, it's a small country. And so they have to manage their, their, their land usage in, in a way that a lot of Americans don't really think about. Mm. Um, uh, it's, and they're, they're very efficient and, and economic uh, uh, in that old sense of the word economic um, uh, about, about how they how they live, you know, even the people in the urban uh, places. And it's a country that was far, far more advanced in terms of doing things like recycling than uh, the United States was and is even um, at, when I was there. And uh, that in terms of, of how they did land management itself uh, was is something that Americans don't really think about because we have such an expansive country that uh, we don't think about space in the same way. So it tends to be like in, in America, we, we, we build uh, our communities horizontally. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I, you know, I noticed in towns in, in Japan is that it was more vertically, like even in, in, in rural uh, places in Japan that um, you, you, you would build up, you know, uh, in order to conserve space so that uh, you weren't you you didn't have this level of suburban sprawl like we have in uh, in America that takes up so much space that isn't really conservative uh, at all to to live that way and uh, so that so it's they were very conservationist uh, oriented there uh, in a way that I think that that, that most Americans aren't and. Uh, but in terms of, uh, of other kinds of, of aspects of, uh, of of rural life there, I mean, I think that they were very, you know, it, everything was ritual. There was a lot of ritualized, you know, aspects to to rural life there, and I think that there is in in American rural life too a, a lot of rituals. But it was to me, it was really pronounced there. There was there was some different tradition that was happening every single month it seemed <laughs> and and that had uh, a long history uh behind it that uh, the students were uh, were were taught you know from from a young age you know at whatever kind of uh, ability you know developmental learning ability uh per you know per age group uh that, that they were learning the stories uh of uh, of their their place uh, uh every single you know, uh, year uh, in their development, and uh, the, the the amount of festivals <laughs> and, uh, and and different kinds of like even age marking traditions that uh, that they that they had there I, were were something that I th I think we have less of here uh, that uh, at least that I experienced less of here uh, growing up. That's really interesting. Um, I think the, the out, not up is a really, really good example of how like physical space, um, shapes culture and cultural ideas about, you know, um, what, what makes sense, you know, um, and, and what's good to do. The festival thing makes me chuckle because, um, I kind of wish we had more, you know, like I, I love too. that idea about like the collective storytelling through, um through community interaction right yeah um, yeah I can remember growing up you know we we had you know our you know various handfuls of, of different festivals and stuff I can remember in the summer we always had our homecoming you know uh kind of a thing which was fun because there was a parade you know down the main you know the main street and you know people would throw candy at the kids lining you know the streets it was a, it's a fun memory but um but yeah, it seems like you can do, do go to a festival that is even bigger and uh, and uh, more elaborate than that uh, every other week in the in the summer in uh, in Japan, uh, and uh, there's something about it that yeah, I think it recons it, it kind of acts as a way of reconstituting the community over and over, bringing people together over and over, uh, in a way that that maybe we've lapsed in, in some of that if I don't you know I'm not a historian so maybe maybe we never quite you know even had built up that idea of uh, of how to do that 
with traditions uh, and rituals, you know, quite to the extent uh, that uh, Japanese society uh, has it built in. But yeah, I think in the town where my um, my parents grew up, um, Tipton, Tipton, Indiana, there's a, um, so that's where the county 4-H fair is held. And so that was always kind of like a big deal, but they also have something called the pork festival. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> where like they they make pork traps and like all these vendors come in and there's you know like um there's a parade and there are there's entertainment um and so like I remember always feeling like more like connected to the community and more part of the community what I'm hoping that like that this work that I'm doing and that the work that rural authors are doing is something that is right that, that collective identity building like even if even if the story is not set in the rural Midwest, there's something about it that is still recognizable and still feels like the characters still feel like community to me. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And so I think that's, I think that's a really, I had never really thought about that, but thinking about um, traditions and rituals and festivals and how they um, sort of function as a collective identity building. Yeah, um, I think that's, I think that's how I feel when I read these books is that I'm continuing, even though I'm an out migrant, even though I live in a subdivision now and, you know, I'm doing my best to feel rural by having my chickens and whatever, you know, <laughs> um, exactly. yeah. um, like reading, reading rural books helps me continue to build my rural identity. And I feel like in, in talking with authors and talking with people um, sort of in an online rural community through my website, like, I feel like those that's kind of what I'm trying to foster that's kind of what I'm trying to build and achieve and so but I had never I couldn't have ever put that in words I don't think um, yeah and I think it's really necessary I think the project that you're doing is important because uh, uh, I think that I think people are introduced to 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 narratives in in urban and suburban s settings uh, all the time but uh, not so much with rural. So thinking about writers and thinking about like writing and editing, um, I'm I'm curious about what your writing process is like. Uh, so I've been writing from like the start, really. I was just interested in storytelling. Uh, but when I, uh, I think, you know, if, if we talk about this in the sense of like when I had determined that I wanted to write professionally, uh, there was a shift in, uh, in how I how I wrote, where I became, I think, pretty obsessive in in terms of acquiring as as much knowledge of writing as as I could, and and trying out a lot of different practices and forms. And once I settled into what I felt was uh, my own voice, uh, and I ended up, you know, doing the thing that you know is 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 an old old kind of rule, which is to write every day, uh, and to make that a part of your day as a ritual and to fit it in whatever, you know, in, in whatever way is like more, most organic for you or that makes sense for you. For me, that I was always a night writer uh, because I always had to work during the day. Uh, and uh, uh, so nighttime became uh, the time when I was most uh, creative and uh, imaginative and um, I'm also not someone who can write in public. Uh, I often see my writer friends who go to coffee shops and uh, different kinds of public spaces to write. I can't do that at all. I'm so easily distracted, but I also feel like, you know, I have a, a quality of shyness about me on some level that even when I'm writing in public, it just doesn't feel right. Like I need the sense of intimacy. I need to be in my, my writing room. Uh, with the door closed. I don't want my cats bothering me. <laughs> I don't want to be able to hear anything. I don't listen to music. I want to be able to hear the music of my of, of the words that I'm trying to, to compose on, on the page and to hear the voices of characters I'm trying to write. And, uh, but, but yeah, generally uh, that process uh, at, for the majority of my 20s and, and early 30s was uh, to write every day and to essentially uh, you know, write uh, almost any idea that I had uh, and to continue to experiment. But I felt like in my mid-30s, 
uh, that kind of, of process was one that uh, I started to, to switch. I started to pick and choose uh, what kinds of uh, projects that I wanted to work on. Once I had written a, a, a few novels and a, a couple of collections of stories, it became more apparent to me. And, and I kind of acknowledged that, oh, now I'm in my middle age, you know, that I won't have the eternity to, to write anything that comes to my mind. And so I have to be more selective at this point uh, because uh, once you give yourself over to writing a book, it's going to consume a lot uh, of time. I'm not necessarily a fast writer, uh, although there have been periods where I have written quickly. Uh, it's, it's not always the case. And uh, uh, from book to book, it's been uh, a, a different kind of process each time. Uh, I feel like I have to learn how to write all over again every time I write a novel in the sense that uh, each one of them presents their own challenges. And because I don't usually, even if there are things, uh, elements from book to book that are recognizably a pattern with me, I, I am always trying to figure out different structures and different um, angles and perspectives to, to, to tell stories through. Uh, so there's always something new that I have to learn how to do when, I, when I'm writing a, a novel. Uh, and uh, the, the more of those things that I incorporate into, into a novel, the more new things that, that I've never done before, then the longer it takes me to figure out how to, how to do it. Uh, from book to book, it's going to be different. Uh, with, the Gone, with The Gone Away Place, that was a book that is mainly told by one narrator, but there are uh, narrators who interrupt and tell their own stories. And so with that one, um, it felt like a, a little bit like putting a, a puzzle together, you know, like, uh, because I would write the different narrators sections separately, some out of order to a certain extent. Um, and then I had to figure out how, how they went together in the pattern that I was building. And, and Ellie, Ellie frame was really the frame for all of them um, to, to, to capture them together and to put their, their stories together. Uh, so uh, it, was a, it was a different process uh, with that book because it was a, while it, it was a linear story, there was a lot of anti-linear movement within it. And I really like that. Like, that's one of my favorite things. <laughs> like, I, I yeah. like when, like, time isn't, I think I said this in my interview with, with Pedro Hoffmeister too, but like that Virginia Woolf quote of like, life is not a series of gig lamps. Right. It's, like always sticks out in, in my mind. And like, it's not. And the past and present and future all it's, it's sort They're of exist, overlap with one another. Yeah. Um, and so I, and I, I really liked too, like, I think it's chapter one and chapter two. Um, like first it's Ellie and then it's like her mom or something. I, I feel like right at the beginning, there's a switch of narrators. And then so like my expectation was because most of the things that do that continue to do that then throughout the rest of the novel, but this one didn't. And then there was like the, um, the psychologist, um, her story and her perspective came in. And then I think there's one chapter from Dan, right from Ellie's. Yeah, the father's dad, point of view. Yeah. yeah, and then each of her friends, friends uh, right. a, a chapter to tell their story, uh, some some story that they want to be remembered for. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, but that sort of always came after, like you knew that was kind of coming because of the situation that Ellie was currently in at the time, and um, but like the other ones were sort of like surprises, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And and I really liked that it wasn't predictable, that it didn't keep continuing. Um, not that I don't like switching narrators. Um, I like stories told from multiple narrators because I yeah. think it's important to get multiple perspectives of what is happening. Um, but I just really enjoyed that it wasn't predictable, and that um, in some cases, especially with the the psychologist, um, I wanted to know more <laughs> about her story. Yeah there are details in there that you don't really, that don't get sort of fleshed out, which makes sense because it's her, it's her psyche. It's her thinking about, you know, and, and so like, she already knows the whole story. And so she doesn't have to divulge the whole story to us. If she, right. you know what I mean? Um, right. And so it just felt really, I just felt like I was really authentically like in her mind, <laughs> like. Right. You know, and, yeah. And that she wasn't narrating to an audience, but she right. was, you know, in a, in a kind of an inner monologue, right. you know, yeah, kind of a exactly. thing. So things that she would narrate the way that I think 
I think we all have a kind of inner narrative, you know, that that's uh, uh, that's running through our days and uh, uh, things that she would relate in that kind of internal uh, narrative aren't necessarily the the kinds of details that uh, would be related to a specific audience outside of herself. Uh, she's a really interesting character to me too. The the psych psychologist in in the Gone Away Place. She's she's based on a real person actually uh, uh, that I did that I used for for research just for the phenomena of community trauma and healing. Mm -hmm. uh, that is kind of under underlying theme in the book. Uh, she's based on uh, Clarissa Pincola Estes, uh, who is a uh, a writer who became famous in the 90s for a book called Women Who Run With Wolves. And uh, so she's a Jungian psychologist and she's, you know, world renowned. And she uh, was, and her, her specialty is in uh, healing communities that have been traumatized for any variety of reasons. Uh, she's in like, for instance, when the shootings at Columbine happened, mm -hmm. Uh, she, the governor of Colorado asked her to come to Littleton and to, to essentially uh, work with the community in healing from that trauma. So she was called on that, you know, and she's, she has been called to other countries where uh, villages have been decimated by earthquakes, things like that. So I, so she, aside from her sort of her books that are about like Jungian symbolism and, and uh, that kind of a thing. She's also just like, uh, you know, a straight up therapist and uh, in her, in her work is she gets results. And so I ended up studying a lot of uh, her, her research uh, and experiences uh, in doing community tra uh, trauma work as a therapist to kind of get an idea of, you know, what a community like the one I was writing about that's been devastated by these tornadoes uh, and where there has been um, a great loss of life uh, as, as opposed to, you know, a few, you know, uh, fewer losses uh, uh, where the entire community needs help, you know, putting themselves back together. Uh, that was also one of the reasons why I, I wanted to have multiple narratives, uh, narrators in, in there is uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, to, to, to sort of show how the, the devastation of, of that uh, event of the, uh, this outbreak of tornadoes uh, has affected a, a variety of people in the town. Um, and it also, it was useful, I think, for the kind of story I was telling in a genre, in, in a sense of the genre of the ghost story. Uh, usually ghost stories are, um, are very tightly wound stories. They, they're usually told through just like one person's experience. And it's almost always this kind of, is the ghost real or isn't it, you know, is this person uh, experiencing, you know, a kind of mental break? You know, what, what is it, you know, that it's usually centered in one person's psyche, if not just one, then maybe only a couple. And, and then even then it's kind of pathologized as a kind of mental uh, break kind of a thing, even with two people who might be like trauma bonded or something like that. Um, but I wanted to write a, a ghost story in which um, everybody is experiencing the, the, the ghost story. So uh, they, so many people have lost somebody in this town that they're all affected, even if they haven't lost their, their own child or their own boyfriend uh, or their own friend. Uh, uh, they know someone who has, uh, and uh, so having that kind of like multiple perspectives in that way, it, it, it was, I think, useful for me to portray that uh, this haunting is collective instead of an individual haunting, so the entire town uh, is, is being haunted, not just uh, one individual. Yeah, and I think too with traditional ghost stories, right, like there's the reason that it's limited to that one or two narrators is because you like you always want the idea that they could be unreliable, you right. know, um, yeah. to exist. But when everyone, including like, you know, Ellie's dad. Um, Who tries uh, to keep the secret. <laughs> right, right. Um, then then th there's no question of reliability. And th there are other parts of the story then that you can really um, sort of focus on and think about. Um, 
and then I was thinking too, like, uh, the loss of life, like 90 people doesn't seem like a lot, I think for, for some people, but when your right. town is 800, right. That's yeah. Over 10% of your population. Exactly. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. It's relative to, to the, to the community. And, and so, yeah, 90 people might not seem like a big deal to, to somebody, you know, in a, in a place that, you know, has a hundred thousand people or more, but in a small community, you know, you, you've lost a lot of people all in one go. Um, so it, it becomes a, a much more traumatic experience in that way because the, uh, the, the trauma is experienced literally by everyone and, and not just, just a few. And I think that's another like a huge way that I connected to this story um, because Gaston's a little town, you know, <laughs> well, still is a little high school. And throughout my time there, like there were, it just seemed like every year there was like a, a tragedy where either one of my like schoolmates died or a teacher died or right. Um, one year, my senior year, two of the kids in my senior class got in a drunken brawl. One of them killed the other one and the other one went to jail for it, you know? Um, and it was just like, and, it, and it's something that like in a, in a small community, it just sends these ripple effects and yeah. that everybody feels it. Yeah. Yeah. Because everybody um, knew those people. Yeah. Yeah. At my, my junior year, um, one of my favorite English teachers committed suicide. Uh -huh. um, one of uh, the like star basketball players like checked a highway because he was late for curfew and died oh. in a car accident. Yeah. Um, and all of those were incredibly traumatic. Yeah. Um, for the whole school i mean everybody feels it yeah every class yeah we didn't do anything except for sit around and either talk about memories that we had of those people talk about how we were processing and so even though we might not have had an estus you know like right um our, our teachers did the best that they could to sort of facilitate some yeah. kind of community healing yeah absolutely. Um, the entire school went to all of the funerals you know yeah and so it's like everybody everybody let like school basically shut down absolutely and, yeah. and we went to collectively mourn with one another and pretty much the entire community did you know yeah um and so I think that thinking about for me from my perspective and just like my own lived experience right because like that's the transaction that happens exactly. here and that's why these stories are really important yeah. um is that you know a reading through my own experience like I'm thinking like man when when John Hunter died like everything stopped like what if 90 John Hunters died, you yeah. know, um, yeah. on one day, like, I just can't, mm -hmm. it's hard to fathom the, um, yeah, it's, it's the shocking, to, you know, to, if, if I had lost, you know, 90 classmates and school teachers or, 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 um, community members in general, uh, when I was in high school and, uh, you know, and we had talked about the size of our classes, you know, my, my high school class was 60, but our community was so small that we, in, in, we had our, our middle school and our, in our high school blended together all in yeah. the same building. It was yep, like we were grade seven through 12. Yep. And, uh, you know, and even then between all of those grades, we still, it was like, you know, 700 students in, in total with all those grades. Um, and, uh, and yeah, is if we lost 90 people, yeah, the school would have shut down completely, entirely. And, uh, and, and a lot of things would have shut down in order to, to, to observe and mourn and, and then to figure out how to, to help people who were directly affected. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't be that same way, I think, in a larger population, there would be a lot of you know, things that like that, that, you know, like that wouldn't come to a, a complete and utter halt, I think, in a suburban or an urban population, if 90 people died in a particular thing, certain segments of it would, but a lot would just continue on as is. Uh, and, and that just wouldn't be the case uh, in, in a small town like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the way she talks about like, there was a vacant building that made it like th that's the other side of this too right it's like the environmental devastation um and i started thinking about like the farmers and their crops <laughs> yeah. yeah um with everything they've lost yeah yeah and the fact that i started reading it like not too long after those tornadoes ripped through kentucky 
um, yeah. and, and did all of that damage. And recently, actually, there was a tornado that touched down in Indiana, sort of near where my folks live. Um, and so like, I just feel like the universe brought it all together and all of yeah. it, the reading of this book, like particularly, um, I don't know, like, I, I don't know, I can't think of the word. Timely. <laughs> huh? Timely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Timely, but also just like, I don't know, like I- important for my own thinking and um, formative in, yeah. in a lot of ways, I think, in terms of even just the way that I think about this project and, and what I'm doing. Um, so thank you for writing it. <laughs> it was my pleasure. <laughs> um, are there any future projects that you have in the works that you wanted to talk about? You sort of mentioned working on a short story collection, but. Yeah, I, I'm working on a short story collection. It's almost finished, but I have one story that I do have to rewrite uh, in it. Uh, and, and then I'm going to write some story notes for it, but it's a collection of short stories called Monstrous Alterations. And uh, they're all retellings and adaptations of classic genre fiction. Although I hesitate to say just classic genre fiction, the first story in it is a, is a fairy tale retelling. Um, but each of the stories sort of that, that I've chosen to retell and adapt in some, some fashion, because um, in, in the ordering of the stories, it kind of mirrors the publication dates that, that the stories mm-hmm. had. So I start with fairy tale as the kind of origin of, of fantasy fiction, and then moving through time, um, I, I work on, on retelling things like uh, Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market, mm-hmm. Uh, or uh, Peter Pan, uh, uh, The Wizard of Oz. Uh, I, I basically adapted, re, just rewrote the first chapter of The Wizard of Oz uh, as a short story and to try to bring a kind of social consciousness to it. Uh, uh, a story by Poe called William Wilson, um, mm-hmm. The Yellow Wallpaper. Yeah. Uh, so the collection moves through time and at the end of it, um, is a an adaptation of several uh, stories of Franz Kafka's. So we start with fairy tale and move uh, all the way to fabulism. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it it spans uh, the kind of evolution of of the, these the form of, of of fantasy fiction over a particular period of time, at least. That's super interesting. Um, I'm really excited about it. (laughs) It sounds so cool. Um, And so then do you sort of alternate between like writing for adults and writing for young adults? I do. Yeah. I, um, I, I, most of my novels are for young adults, but some of them have been for adults. uh, And uh, same with the short stories. Uh, Sometimes it, depends on just what I'm interested at the moment in writing. Uh, Other times, you know, sometimes I've been asked to write a story that's specifically for a young adult anthology Mm -hmm. uh, of short stories. And so in that case, then I'm very deliberately, you know, I've I've been, you know, asked to write for a particular occasion and audience. And so um, uh, that's a much more like purposeful in in a sense of deliberate, you know, uh, of writing for that audience. But otherwise, yeah, I move back and forth between young adult and and adult writing. Um, And uh, just whatever the particular story I'm trying to tell needs uh, is is what dictates that. Um, Do you have any uh, parting words or other advice you would like to give to either young people or teachers who are writers themselves and um, or just you know for the for cultivating a writing life or anything at all (laughs) yeah don't give up be persistent um and uh i i feel like that that most people can do this and have a rich and rewarding life as a writer uh in a variety of ways uh, not necessarily rich and famous, but <laughs> but um, that's not necessarily the end game for for every everything. You know, not everything has to be about making money and being the most popular, uh, uh, whatever uh, in in life. Uh, and, and if you don't give up on it, if you continue to practice and and to continue challenging yourself with with writing, that you will strike gold at some point with it. And uh, and, and hopefully it'll be a really large vein. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much um, for talking with me. Thank you for being so generous with your time. And um, 
thank you for writing the gone away place i really enjoyed it and i will definitely be checking out more of your work um and i hope that the viewers of this and or listeners of the podcast version will too thank you yeah it's been great spending time with you 